Hey everyone! So you might remember this map that we looked at at the beginning of the year of train connections in Central Europe from around 1900. It was created by Julius Ritter, K and K Oberkontrolleur im Handelsministerium. So it a map that was created in the Habsburg Empire. And we had a look last time at the connections mainly from Vienna and the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We said that there's quite a fascinating density here in what is today roughly the Czech Republic and Slovakia that we had connections here all the way to Lemberg and then south to Czernowitz but also through what is today Austria, to Salzburg, Munich, today Germany of course, and Innsbruck and then further towards Switzerland. And the connection to Graz, Leibach or Ljubljana, and Trieste which belonged to the Habsburg Empire for a long time. We didn't really look at the Hungarian part um, and I've had some trouble finding um, good sources that I could bring with me. One of you was so kind to send me a lot of links with historic maps. But I have yet to find a solution to show them to you without printing them out myself, which doesn't really look that great. So we have Budapest here along the Danube. Um, I think you would be here, Gishalom. And I think we had this question last time that Bratislava must be somewhere here. But it's not... Uh, depicted as prominently as Budapest. Nonetheless, we can see that Budapest uh, functions as a center to the Hungarian part of the Habsburg Empire, with connections not just towards Vienna, but also northbound to the west, where you would cross back towards the uh, Austrian side in Lemberg but also here is southeast to Timisoar and towards Bucharest and then onwards to the Black Sea We also have a connection to Belgrade and from here uh, we set this last time a curiously lonely connection to Sofia and Constantinople right here And we see that the lines kind of fizzle out here when we get to the uh, Balkan. So you can get to Sarajevo but that is clearly not a very fast connection here. Uh, 
unlike the connection here towards cards again, Yubiana, or also, let's see which, which way this one goes, maybe more this way, towards Sacred. And then to the Adriatic Sea, Trieste, and down here, Cola. So I thought what we could do is to take some detailed maps of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and go from there to kind of have a closer look at why it developed the way it did, and what these connections meant. So I'm going to take in my trusted school atlas here. And we have a couple of different maps here over two pages that all depict different stages of the Habsburg Empire. We're going to start relatively early here with the time between 16 and 1800. In dark, I don't know if this is red or already more pink, so that this dark color is what the Habsburg Empire looked like around 1600. So here we can see some back and forth, but basically Bohemia, Moravia, what would be Austria today, as well as uh, Slovenia, and parts of Italy with Trieste belong to the Habsburgs. In the uh, 17th and 18th century, they also take hold of Croatia and first Hungary, including Transylvania and then 1718 the Banat falls to them for a limited period also Serbia and what is listed here is Kleine Walachai, Small Wallachia. North we have Galicia and I think I mentioned this last time this is an area that does not exist anymore in this form it was called Galicia and Lodomeria um, two names that date back to the Middle Ages and that just happen to uh, sound similar to the Spanish region, Galicia here, but there's no direct connection. This includes part of what is today Poland and here with Lemberg of Ukraine. And we also have the Bukovina here, which falls to Austria later in 1775. To the south here we have the Ottoman Empire. So what we can see on this map basically is that this region here would have been a border region and especially um, parts of Hungary and uh, Transylvania. Um, you could also see that this was a border region. So what the Habsburgs try to do is to get people to settle there, to make sure that it would stay within their empire. Um, we usually speak of Schwaben, but they were not necessarily exclusively Schwaben, so it was from different parts, um, usually of German-speaking countries. And in Siebenbürgen you still have some uh, cities that have German names until this day, like Hermannstadt. 
even if the number of actual German speakers is quite small. Right, if we jump to the next one, we are here in 1775, so during the, the age of Joseph II. We are before Napoleon, so here in green, we still have the border of the Holy Roman Empire which, as you already know, um, ceased to exist during the age of Napoleon. And here we can see how much that which I've just mentioned and Kronstadt. So this would today be Romania. This would be Budapest, Bratislava, Vienna, and yes, Park. And we also have some information here about the uh, economy. In pink, we can see here FE standing for iron. as well as in uh, basically some of the central regions of Austria today. Then in blue, we have uh, textile production. So here, along the northern region, in Bohemia and Moravia. As well as here. All the way in the west. In green, we also have glass production. And let's say, do we have anything else important? This little hat here stands for sugar. But I only see it next to Vienna, next to Prague. We also have some tobacco factories which I think is quite fascinating. Here next to Fiume. Again between Vienna and Bratislava. Here next to Prague. But you can see that the economy is really centered in the, um, what would later become the Austrian half. If we go further east, especially Galicia and Ludomeria don't have any um, information filled in here. We have a little bit here in Hermannstadt, some chemical manufacturing and metalwork, but that's somewhat where some more of an agrarian culture. And um, that definitely was an issue during that age that uh, so the Habsburg Empire felt a little behind compared to the progress that was happening in um, the UK or in France. So here we have the Napoleonic time. We've recently had a look at that. Uh, we know that the Habsburgs lost some areas then regain them. Maybe we could have a quick look at this because you can quite nicely see the different parts of the empire. So again, you have Austria here, Bohemia, Moravia, Galicia and Ludomeria, Bukovina, 
Sieben Filme aus Transylvania, we have Hungary, Slavonia, I think this here would be the Banat, which is sometimes separately mentioned. Or maybe we have a little further to the east here in this region. Croatia, Dalmatia, partly also Tuscany was built by the Habsburgs. And here you have a uh, Carniola or Krein in German, Corinthia, Styria, Tyrol, etc. By the middle of the 19th century, the Habsburg Empire turned into Austria and Hungary. So two separate entities unified under the Habsburg crown. And we said this when we looked at the uh, train map. The Austrian part actually extended as far to the east as the Hungarian part via this northern extension here to Galicia and Lodomeria. We have Saxony here, Schlesien, here's Krakow, and the Russian Empire. And this part here came to the Habsburgs when Poland was split up for the first time. So these were historically Polish areas, but generally quite a mixed population, especially further east. The Hungarian part is also larger than Hungary today. You can see it follows the Danube here. And then cuts across through Transylvania. If we compare it with the states today, or specifically this would be um, 1919. Some parts still look the same, some don't. We have Hungary. Losing some areas here, the Burgenland. Sorry, this is the Trau, not the Danube. The Danube comes down here, of course. So Trau. Then cross here. And Transylvania goes to Romania. You can see that it largely follows the different peoples that lived in the Habsburg Empire. So in yellow we have Hungarians. But you can also see that the borders don't quite match where people lived. Of course, especially if you look at this part here, it's close to impossible to map that out in a state. Um, you had a, a policy of making sure that people moved in from different parts of the empire, so you have a mixed population, you have different languages being spoken. Especially here, if you look at Romania, you have Hungarian, you have German, as we said earlier. Of course, you have Romanian in large parts. But the same is true for what would later become uh, Yugoslavia. Again, you have German areas. You have some Romanian bits here. You have Croatian along the coastline, but also here in the center. 
surrounded by uh, Serbs and Bosniaks. Slovenian people here and then of course we've also had a look at the southern Tyrol which went to Italy eventually and you can see quite nicely here with uh, Galicia Lurmeria that the western part was dominated by a Polish speaking um, population and the eastern part by a Ukrainian speaking population again you have some pink German bits here and it's important to notice that German here doesn't just include German but also Yiddish so Today that would probably be counted as two languages But the reason I actually wanted to pick these maps is because of this one So here we can see some of the road connections um, train lines and connections by different rivers Let's take a closer look at that The most important one was certainly the Danube from Germany past Vienna and Bratislava to Budapest and then south past Belgrade towards the Black Sea It wasn't just the only connection we also have here, the Save the Drau and outside of the Habsburg Empire but still important Oder, Wechsel, Elbe and here in Italy We have some ships on the lakes the Balaton lakes in uh, Carinthia in Upper Austria in the Tyrol and here at Lake Constance which lies between Switzerland, Germany and Austria Along the Adriatic Sea we have connections from different ports so I'm assuming that this refers to ferries um, so Schifferzlinie mit Zeitangabe I'm guessing it means it took six and a half hours from Trieste to Venice 11 hours from Venice to Pula, which was a military harbour 12 hours from Venice to Ancona 9 hours from Ancona to Zara and 14 hours from Trieste to... let me see what that says Brindisi, which is not a port I know It feels like this takes quite long but then who knows what kind of ships they were using We also of course have the train connections and there's one that really stands out and that's the Orient Express which comes from Istanbul past Sofia North crossing the Danube here in Belgrade and into the Habsburg Empire through the Hungarian part to 
to Budapest and then past Bratislava to Vienna and from there again roughly following the Danube Let me see to Salzburg, right? It's this one here. To Munich, through Germany, basically, and then onwards to Paris. There are also some smaller connections, like here from Zurich to Paris. But of course, not quite as famous. We have um, both state lines and private lines. Um, let's see, so Hungarian would be green. But um, I'm not seeing private. It just says uh, domestic private lines, but it doesn't say if this refers to um, the Austrian or the Hungarian side, so I guess it doesn't matter in that case. Okay, so we have the connection from Budapest to Kasha. From there you can continue on a private line to Austria. Oh, you come from the other side, from Vienna. You can go to Raab, and then... What is it? Oh, here. It goes further south. To Budapest. From Agra. Again, I think it's quite clear that this is relatively centralized around Budapest. And you can see that the connections towards the Bukovina, for example, are slower and more rare. Then you can get to Hermannstadt and Kronstadt and you can continue to Bucharest. One interesting aspect here is also that um, Bosnia and Dalmatia are part of the Austrian part of the empire. So you have to cross through the Hungarian part, which would include Croatia. And lastly, if we look at the economy again, we skip forward by about 100 years to 1870 to 1900. We can see that the green and blue areas are still largely agrarian in some form or another. The blue part here is clearly Alpine territory, as well as here in the Carpathian Mountains, and down here. In yellow, we have a largely agrarian, but in a more flat area. You have the Pannonic Basin here in the center between Alps, Carpathian Mountains, which would continue down here. Yeah, you mostly have cattle in the blue areas, the slight blue one. So these little dots 
dots would be along here This is basically a um, subsistence economy um, Fascinatingly, the part I don't know if that's quite maps but the uh, easternmost part of Austria which we saw here, which came to Austria quite late and was part of Hungary before was one of the poorer parts of Austria for a long time and really profited from joining the European Union so an area that's doing a lot better today again, of course, in the 20th century a difficult position right along the hard border But here, I guess the important part especially is here, marked in red, important industrial zones. So that's um, close to Graz. Again, still an area that's quite important today. Here, north of Prague. Especially when it comes to textiles Right here around Witkowitz And around uh, Vienna So this would be um, an increase in metal industries it doesn't quite describe which is which but for example here in Styria for example here in Steyr it's a city that still prides itself on that history and if we're looking at the entire map we can see concentration here in Bohemia along Vienna you can see a center here in Budapest but the further out towards the periphery you get the industry becomes spare so a clear difference I think between center and periphery Right, and I think that's something that we also noticed when we looked just at the train connections Very, very busy train lines in an economically prosperous region Important train lines here in this connection and then becoming thinner as we go to the eastern parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire Alright, so there were a lot of maps today I hope it was interesting to you and I will see you again next week when we explore this part down here. Alright, see you then.